Okay, welcome back, everybody. Hope everybody's doing okay. A uh, couple of announcements, if you will. I got everything graded that I that's been submitted that was due, so everything's up to par. Next week, the nomenclature exam. I've only had one one student complete it. Uh, the nomenclature exam. I'm going to set that. If, if you're not done it, I'm going to set it to zero, so that you can see where you truly are with respect to uh, your grade. Because right now, it's it that the nomenclature exam is not counted in the overall grade because it hasn't been graded unless you actually did it. Okay. So your grade will probably drop. Don't get freaked out. It gives you a perspective of where you truly are at that time. And then as you complete it and you hit the 80% mark, obviously it goes up. All right. So I don't want to wait because this is the end of the third week. We got five more weeks to go. I don't want to wait till like the second week or you know a week before we finish. And then you start thinking, oh my God, I gotta get it done, get rushed, and because it maybe dropped you. At least now you've got five weeks to to uh, uh, finish that exam. If it affects your grade, you know, if it put, picks you up where you're at and drops you. But at the same time, you could be uh, at the cost someplace and it's not allowing you to get up, you know, it can affect you, your ability to get up to the next grade up above. So anyway, don't freak out when I put it to zero. Uh, any questions about that? No? All right, we have a page slide. We were on chapter five. Uh, slide, uh, yeah, question here. Yes, the exam, uh, um, I did open up well, two things. All of the homework should be opened up. I sent an email to that effect. So when you complete it, you're able to see the correct answer. With respect to the homework, um, I will open that up also. Uh, we got, um, I, need, I need to discuss it with the department uh, because there's some other issues involved there. So yes, I will open it up, get the exam opened up so you can see the, the actual the correct answers, okay? Uh, I'll shoot you an email to let you know. All right, any other questions? Oh, the nomenclature exams are taking it, you know. Uh, you're welcome, Britton. Take it. I mean, you have unlimited uh, attempts. <clears throat> At least you get an idea of what type of question you know, questions are being asked, or you can prepare for it. Like I said, you only need eighty percent. There's twenty questions, and so you need to get, you know get uh, sixteen right. After you after you do them, I go in there and I check. I check your answers, which I do with with everything, and of course I do miss occasionally. And if I ever miss uh, uh, miss something, and you know it's correct, shoot me an email. I definitely will fix it. Uh, uh, but because uh, the uh, normal again, Canvas is not AI, okay, and um, so I go in there and check it. So as soon as you get eighty percent, you're done. You don't have to go any further. You can continue to up that eighty percent all you want because it will keep the highest grade. Uh, so, and also don't forget on the course website, do we have the uh, uh, resource to help you out? with naming is uh, we went through that in the beginning of the semester. So uh, use that as a resource to help you learn the names. Now we're gonna have a chapter on that coming up. And as we go along, whenever we get chemicals, I introduce you to the name and so forth, okay? Uh, well, the reason, Becca, it says it is due the 31st, okay? What is, and it's reason is set up that way so that you can take as many, what happens is because it's, if, it's, if I set that up for an earlier due date, uh, it will, and you try to attempt it after the due date, it treats it as, as late. And so yes, the 30, 21st, 21st is their last day where everything is due. If you have anything late, that's the last due date. So it's basically open up for the full semester for you to take it, okay? Whenever you want. There's due dates for everything, the homework, 
you're more than welcome to do the homework way ahead. You can be doing chapter 15 right now if you want, you know. So uh, just because it's it's set for the whatever date doesn't mean you have to wait till then. And that's why I'm telling you about the nomenclature. It's a special thing because that one um, will uh, can affect your grade drastically. Okay. Uh, next week, I'm going to add a zero. Natasha had a question to the scores that haven't been completed to give you an idea of where your grades at. Okay, that's the whole point of adding zero. I, I uh, been through this in number of semesters where I waited toward the last week. Since it wasn't done, I added a zero, and then people got freaked out and they got a week to do anything because at the 21st, everything shuts down. You can't access any assignments. So that prevented people, you know, they freaked out. They had a week, they were on the border and they were thinking they were getting an A and all of a sudden they got kicked down to B. Or, you know, they were close to an A, but it got moved them further away. So what I do now, I repeat this, what I do now, way before the semester ends, even though it has a due date of the last day of the week, okay, I add a zero so that you know what your grade truly is because right the way Canvas uh, calculates your grade, it only calculates those grades that have those assignments that have been graded. And so you may be carrying an A right now, okay? But you know, we got a multiple assignments you have to do. And once those are done, then those are calculated to real overall grade. So the nomenclature exam is just the only special case that we put a zero in there early so you can see where you sit. Okay. I did. I, I don't have a specific day. I probably do it this weekend, and it'll, it'll, it'll show you. Okay, and that's why I repeat: when you see that happen, do not get freaked out. Okay, because there's a multiple of other assignments you haven't done, and when you do them, your grade obviously will go up where it truly is. But, but I emphasize the fact that at least you know now that the nomenclature could be a big factor in your overall grade, okay? And some people, you know, to be honest, uh, if you're in the middle of a, in a, a or B or C, going, you know, 10% longer there has no effect. Okay, so that it all depends on where you're at. And this is mostly for people who are on the cusp, okay? And it gives you a better idea. I don't want you going with the false, false pretense that you're doing well with the grade and then at the end of the semester because you haven't done it I have to throw in a zero and then your grade drops and you got less than a week to try to finish it up okay all right does that make sense okay uh, these this is the option I had to do because I've gone through this multiple times of not putting anything in there until the end of the semester and and um and don't, don't get too fixated with the due date. If you want to do that early, any of the assignment, except the exams, those are specific, but the homeworks. Again, also I'm going to throw in some extra credit work in there too. Uh, do those, you know, you can do them ahead of time. And no, one, no one's stopping you, they're open. But keep in mind uh, that on the 21st, uh, Double check that. That is our last day. Yep, 21st is our last day of class. And that is when Canvas shuts down. And if you have any assignment you have not done, uh, you, you won't have access to it. Okay. All right. All right. Any other questions? All right, well, let us continue. All right, we were on chapter five. We have been dealing and talking about the electron configurations and how the electrons are, at least our model shows how the electrons are placed around uh, the uh, atom. Okay. And what we've uh, have our model that tells us that one, uh, let me back it up just to review our, yeah, this one. 
One, we have seven energy levels, seven energy levels, which coincides to the seven, what we call um, uh, periods of the periodic table, seven of them, okay? Now, these energy levels, the first energy level has what we're called sublevels slash orbitals, and that's what I'm gonna call. So we got energy levels, and within the energy levels, we have some orbitals, okay, or orbits, either way. The first energy level only has one type of orbit, and that is designated with the letter S. <clears throat> They're rounded the shape, okay? Now, all, the, all seven levels have the S orbit. So you can see we got the 1s, the 2s. The 1 coefficient represents the energy level that that orbit is in. So the 1 up front, the letter, is the energy level. When we go to the second energy level, or the second period in the periodic table, we introduce an additional orbit. We call that the p orbitals, OK? There are three p orbits. And they're designated here by these boxes, okay? Three of them. And so now keep in mind that in every orbit, we can put in two electrons. Every orbit, regardless of its S, P, D, or F, can only handle two electrons, okay? And I designate that by, by two arrows going in opposite directions. When we reach the second energy level, we introduce, we, we also continue with the S, but then we introduce the P orbit. And note, there are three P orbits with every orbit having the capability of handling two electrons. So again, the S can handle two electrons, and then each one of the P's can handle two, so we can put a total of six electrons in the P orbits. So we got six here total, two for the S. So the total maximum number of electrons for every energy level will be two for the first energy level and eight electrons total for the second energy level. When we go into the third period of the periodic table, okay, uh, we introduce an, an additional, a, another orbit, which we call the D. There are five D orbits, okay? We continue with three P orbits and again with the S. Now, the difference between the two P orbit, I put a two here, and the three P orbit is this. It's just the size. The two P, there's three orbits, but it's smaller in diameter because it's in the second energy level. When we move to the three P, guess what? We just get bigger. That's all it is. They have the same shape but they're just bigger. And the same is true with the one, the one S orbit, the two S orbit, and the three S orbit. And that continues to the four position uh, and the three, okay, and the four, and then the four, okay? And so the, they only differ in, in, in the diameter and how big they are, depending on what energy level they're at. So therefore here we can put 10 total of electrons in the 3D, six again in the, in the P orbit and two. So we can put a total of 18 electrons maximum for the third energy level. And then at the fourth energy level, we introduce the F orbits, which there are seven of them, which tells us that we can put in 14 electrons. We continue with 10 for the D, six for the P, two. So we have a total of 32 electrons that we can place in the fourth energy level. So if we are, let's say, at the third energy level, and now you're dealing with an element that has 19 electrons, guess what? It goes up, that one electron extra goes into the next energy level. All these orbits are specific energy levels, okay? And that, this information comes from the line spectra. That is when, we, when uh, uh, atoms or elements were subjected to a, a like a, a fluorescent bulb, the light that they emitted was an analyzed. It broke up into different, into the spectrum using the prism and each line represented a specific wavelength, okay? All right.
And then uh, we briefly talked about the shapes, the S. Now keep in mind, the, the S, P, D, and F orbits, regardless of what energy level they're in, they're nothing more than mathematical equations, okay? And with any type of mathematical equation, you can take data. Thing is, they're three-dimensional mathematical equations, X, Y, and Z, and you can take data, plot it, and then you end up with an image for that math mathematical equation, and that is the image here of the S orbit that says, um, you're basically telling us that uh, uh, there's a probability of a, an electron, S, an S electron being somewhere in that, in that uh, colored area, that uh, aqua colored area. Obviously, being outside that area, there's a zero probability, but as you go into this deeper into, into the center, it gets a little darker, so there's a probability of an electron being there. Now, with respect to the p orbits, we have three of them, and we call those uh, the dumbbell shape. There are three of them because they go on the three axes, x, y, and z, and there's two lobes, okay? So if you can imagine, if you can combine those, those, those uh, six lobes, if you will, together, they got to give you an overall picture of what our motto is, where these electrons exist. Keep in mind that every, every orbit can have two electrons. So you can put a maximum of three electrons. Okay. Now the Ds want to have a picture of them, but I did suggest if you like to see what they look like, you can Google that and ask if you can show me an image of a D and F orbit, and you'll find them to be some very unusual looking material uh, uh, shape due to the mathematical equation in which you plot the data. All right, now, uh, there is this table here that helps you and assists you to write the, what we call the electron configuration, okay, of the elements uh, with respect to where their electrons exist with respect to what energy level and what orbit. And the sequence begins here, you can follow the it's written here in blue in, in the diagram, 1s, 2s, 3p. Uh, the top diagram kind of gives you a better picture here, if you will. Follow the arrows. You start off with the very first energy level, obviously. So it's a 1s energy level that can handle two electrons. So 1s1, superscript 1, represents one electron, and that is hydrogen. 1s2, super, superscript 2, represents hydrogen. So you're basically going across the periodic table. If you, if, you, if you follow it through. And then you, when you're done with helium, you wrap it around to lithium. And guess what? You're in the second energy level, which is the second energy period. You're in the first column, OK? Uh, because I, I uh, want to, there's a question. OK. All right, all right. The DNF are in the videos, in the other videos, Dr. Kim. Yes. That link used to work. Back then, when that uh, uh, videos were made, so quick she was able to record them. But thank you, Waterley. Take a look at it. But we're not gonna. We're really not gonna get much into with the shapes and really get into the electron configurations of the DNAs. It's more for informational purposes. Okay. All right. Um, the other <coughs> way other than memorizing that table is to use the periodic table, okay? Using the periodic table, which I, I make, I, I, I uh, um, use it quite a bit. There's a ton of information on the periodic table, okay? For example, bear with me for a second. If you look at the, the Roman numerals on top of each column, okay? We got the 1A, the 2A, we jump over to the 3A, the 4A, the 5A, the 6A, 7A, and the 8A. What that represents, that Roman numeral represents the number of valence electrons for those elements in that column, okay? The valence electrons are those electrons in the outermost shell. An element will have an X amount of electrons, okay? And we start filling up the energy levels, one, two, three, four, and five. And then when it's done, in the outermost shell, we call that the valence electrons. Now, with respect to these A elements, 
that Roman numeral um, corresponds to the number of valence electrons. So what does that tell you is this, that everybody in group 1A, everybody has one valence electron on the outermost shell, even though they may have a multiple. Lithium has three electrons. Lithium is number three right here. Total three electrons. Of those three electrons, two in the innermost shell, and that one is in the outermost shell. Sodium has 11 electrons, okay? And as we go through electron configurations, you end up with one valence electron in the outermost shell. Specifically, noting the period that it's in, it, you can at a glance tell me that it's in the 1s1 orbit. Okay, so we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, six, and seven. Those are the seven energy levels, okay? Now, uh, earlier I said, think of these two in the first group, first two group, think of those as the S, S is in SAM elements. There are two columns that corresponds very well with the S orbits of S1, superscript one, meaning one electron, okay? And then it was remove over because each orbit, each S orbit can handle two electrons. They remove over to group two, it's S2. Okay, the next electron comes in, this fills the that same S orbit in the same energy level. Okay. Now everybody in group two all have two valence electrons. <coughs> Excuse me. And the fact, here's here's the kicker: the fact that they're in the same group. The fact that they have the same number of valence electrons also tells you that they have the same similar type of reactivity simply because the number of valence electrons in the outer shell. Because as I stated, that's where all the action is happening. That's where all the chemical process occurs. It is not in the innermost electrons because the innermost electrons, those orbits are full. Okay, and once they're full, they're happy if you want. <laughs> Your textbook uses the term happy, okay, for whatever happy means, I call it stable. They're, they're stable because the electrons are for full, and, and because they're full, it's going to take energy to take any more out, okay? And so we also realize that the, the, one, the elements in group one and two, with the exception hydrogen, is not a metal, okay? Hydrogen is not a metal but it has the capability of, uh, everybody has the capability of being metals, everybody, all the metals in group one will lose one electron. Because I stated before, long-term memory, metals want to lose electrons, okay? And the question is, well, how many? Well, it depends on where they're at in the periodic table. The metals in group one all want to lose one electron, resulting in that all the metals in group one we end up with a positive one charge because they lost one electron. So sometimes that concept is a little bit difficult to grasp, but think about this mathematically. If I have five positive values and five negative values, do they not cancel each other out, right? Five positive, five negatives, I end up with a net zero, but that is the element. All the elements here have an equal number of positive protons, equal number of negative electrons. So they end up with a net zero. Now, if I have, uh, let's say sodium has 11 protons and 11 electrons, the element is a net zero. But being a metal and it has one valence electron, sodium will lose one electron. So now it has five positives and 10 negatives. So mathematically, what's my net? Positive one, right? Because all the positives cancel the negatives except for one positive that has no negative. So it ends up with a negative uh, charge when those, those elements in group one lose an electron. Do the same thing, what we just talked about, and move it over to group two. And guess what? They lose two electrons. And the result is that everybody in group two, all the metals in group two, A, will end up with a positive two charge when they lose those two electrons. And by losing those two electrons, we're gonna have some examples. What happens is those outer electrons that are out there all by themselves, 
take a lot of energy to, to, to hold on to them. It's easier to get rid of them. So now the next shell that comes into play is full. And the fullness meaning that there's eight electrons in the next shell, with the exception of uh, hydrogen or helium where they got two. So the magical number is either two for hydrogen and everybody else is eight. That's the magical number that they're striving. And the metals, by losing the electrons, obtain that magical eight. The non-metals in the other end of the spectrum gain electrons to obtain that magical eight number to fulfill those electrons. Okay, so here's the S. If you go over across from 3A all the way across to 8A, think of those as the P elements, okay? And starting with boron, so everybody in, everybody in the same column, what they have in common is the number of valence electrons. So boron and aluminum have three valence electrons. Nitrogen and phosphorus have five valence electrons. Fluorine, chlorine, all of them, even though they got different, chlorine has nine total electrons, chlorine has 17 total electrons. But of those nine for fluorine, seven of them on the outermost shell, seven. Now think about this from an energy perspective. Now, is it easier to get rid of those seven or to gain one? And sure enough, that's what happens. These guys being non-metals gain electrons because they have room to get one electron. And they fill up that orbit with eight. So everybody in group seven will pick up one electron to get that magical eight. Because everybody in group eight, with the exception of helium, which has two valence electrons, everybody else has eight valence electrons. And that is the stable state, if you will. That is the stability of these elements to, to reach, to be able to be stable. And they're gonna reach that by either losing or gaining electrons, or we're gonna learn, they're gonna do that by sharing electrons. Right now, I'm talking, I'm talking about totally losing electrons, totally gaining electrons, okay? That is a specific type of compound. And those are called icons, uh, icons, <laughs> ionic compounds. Okay, these are the guys that we're gonna get, we're gonna talk about that they totally gain an electron, which is a, a non-metal, or totally lose an electron, which is a metal. But the other type is covalent. Okay, which are not ionic, and these guys also strive to do that but they don't, they're gonna share electrons. So what they end up doing is sharing the electrons to get that magical eight, okay? They don't break apart, but they stay together and they share and create an actual physical bond, okay? But in both cases, either ionic or covalent, the, the drive is to um, get that magical eight, the stable eight, Except for hydrogen, and that's the one you just got to put in your mind. It's 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 um, it's always up, strive for two electrons, okay? Which means that keep this also in mind. Hydrogen always would have only one bond because every bond represents two electrons. All right. So going back, question: What about the hydrogen bonds? All hydrogen bonds will only have a two electrons. For example, we're going to learn, let me draw this. We can draw, we can draw hydrogen. And let's say we just for argument's sake right now, we're going to bond it to carbon. And what we do is we draw a line. That line represents a bond. A bond that is that those in that line represents two electrons. There's two electrons being shared. Two electrons being shared in that bond. Okay. And so those two electrons are shared with the hydrogen and with the carbon, okay? So hydrogen, its rule is not an octet, the A, its rule is a duet. So it's always striving for two electrons, either totally gain two electrons or share two electrons. And the way I wrote this, it's sharing those two electrons with the carbon atom. Everybody else is, is striving to share or 
pick up electrons to get that magical eight number. All right, so going back to electron configuration, keep in mind we got the P, so we got from column three, P superscript one, and go across all the way there to group 8A, you go P superscript six, okay? And then the coefficient, it depends on what period it's in, okay? So the P's don't come into, come into play until we get into the second energy level, okay? And we shoot across. And so as we go across the product table, we can very quickly say uh, beryllium is 2s2, then we shoot across the boron. That's where the electron, the P electrons begin, and that becomes 2p1. And if we shot all the way across the neon, that would be 2p6, okay? And guess what? Once we're done with neon, you got 10 electrons. If we go around the horn, if you will, to number 11, which is sodium, now we begin again with the new energy level. And so its electron, since the second energy level is full, it's got to go up to the second energy level and specifically into 3s1, okay? And that's why I, 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 I like the periodic table because you can see it right there. And I'm gonna have a, I'm gonna have a periodic table to show you what I just, what I've been talking about, how you can just follow it based on where that element is, do the electron configuration based on where, where it's at in the periodic table. All right, let me clear this up and we'll go back. Okay, so be, be, be able to do at least the, the first 20. And we did that last time. So here we got carbon. Well, carbon, if you find it in a periodic table, okay, and if we go, let me pull it back up, all right, and I can do it very quickly. All right, and you're asked to write the electron configuration. So what I do, I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to get my periodic table. I'm going to mark where carbon's at. I'm going to find it, okay? All right, then I have marked over here one and two and three, etc. I have over here, these are the S elements and over here I got the P to help me out to remember, okay? So I got six electrons to work with. So obviously the first energy level, the first energy level is full, right? So I got the one S two. Because remember in the first energy level, the only thing I have is the S orbit. Now in the second energy level, I have two, I have the S orbits and I got the, two, the P orbits, okay? Well, the S you, from left to right, the S orbits are full. They fill up first because they are, from an energy perspective, the S orbits are a little bit lower in energy than the P. So they get filled up first. Remember energy and mother nature takes the, 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 the easy route and the easy route is the sodium, the, and the S is less energy to, lower energy level, so they get filled up first, okay? So we also know that S can handle a maximum of two. All right, so now it takes care of two. I start off with six. I just took care of four electrons, and that means I got two electrons to go, okay? So the only place they can be is into the P. And so very quickly, I put superscript uh, P, and guess what? Uh, uh, carbon is in period number four, okay? The second column of the P elements. So this is P1, P2, P3, P4, P5, and P6, okay? Right, now don't, don't do this. Don't go 2P1 and 2P1, all right? Uh, no, the, combine them, combine them, they remember the, uh, the, the superscript represents how many electrons that, that you're at, at the P orbits, so combine them. The same is true for the S, isn't that 2S1 and 2S1? Put them together, okay? So verify my number of electrons, two, four, and six, which is consistent with what carbon had, and that is my electron configuration for carbon. If I needed to go to nitrogen, Piece of cake, right? I just go make that two into a three, right? If I need to make oxygen, do oxygen, well, no piece of cake, go and make that three into a four. If I go to fluorine, make that four into a five. And finally, if I need neon, I make that five into a six. 
okay? So see how you progress the atom. And then if I wrap it around, run the horn, and I go to sodium, I got all that, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, and now introduce 3s1, okay? And just continue so forth. All right, uh, let me clear this up. So that's using the product table, or if you like, follow it with the uh, sequence given here. Okay. All right. We talked about the orbits and the different times. We will always fill up first the S, specifically we go from the first energy level and we move up. Within the orbits, the S is a lower energy than the P, which is a lower energy than the D, which is a lower energy than the F. So we fill them up in that sequence from left to right, S, P, D, and F. Okay. Uh, this here is what I've been uh, talking about as far as um, thinking about the elements on the product table as the S elements or the S block, if you will, on the far left. Then we got the Ds here in the center. Okay. And, you know, if I were to sequentially say D1 all the way across to D10, okay? Over here would be, you know, S1, and then this column would be S2. And then from here would be P1 all the way across to P6. And then the coefficient, and then of course F, F1 to F14. And then the coefficient in front of it, depending on what position it's at and what energy level it's at. Now, the thing to remember about the Ds is the Ds you don't have to worry until you get here if you ever need to. The Ds are not involved until you reach element number 21, okay? And the other aspect to remember is the Ds for element 21, you would think that they'll be in the fourth energy level, but from the, math the mathematics involved, which should be on the scope here, the D orbitals for element 21 do not come out at 4D, but actually are in one energy level. And so these begin to be 3D, okay? And then obviously the one below would be 4D. Now with respect to the F, it's looking at the period it's in, it is two periods in. So if they're in the if they are in the six energy level, which is six and seven, the S actually are two energy levels in from where they are in the actual periodic table, okay? So one for the D and two for the S as far as what energy level they come out of. Um, all right, so very quickly, we can do the, the sodium. Sodium is, clear this up. Sodium is right here. Okay, we got 1s, 2s, and 3. So we go 1s2, okay, 2s2, 2p6. We're going all the way across the periodic table. That's neon right there. That is the electron configuration for neon. And then we go one more around the horn, if you will, which is 3s1. Okay, count the superscripts. So you'll see there's 11 electrons there. 11, 2, 4, 6, that's 10 plus 1, that's 11 electrons. All right, the oxygen is right here. And so oxygen, you were only, you were only going to go as far as the second energy level. So obviously, the two, 1s2 is full, the 2s2, because we're going across the product table, 2s2, and then look and see what column it's on for the P block, and it's in the fourth column, so that is 2P4, okay? So that is the electron configuration for oxygen. And then calcium, find calcium, calcium is right here, number 20. All right, it is, it's in the third energy level. So we're gonna go all the way to the third energy level. And so I like, like the others, the first two electrons occupy the S orbit, 1S2. 
this next set of electrons are 2s2 because the s is full. Now we move over to the p's. So it becomes 2p6. You're going all the way around the, across the periodic table, okay, to, to neon. And now we go around the horn, second energy level, like sodium. Look at sodium. Sodium is the first column, has one valence electron. Okay, calcium is right next to it. Excuse me, right next to the next column is one, one energy level down. Okay, but 4s2. Okay. And calcium and then chloride or chlorine okay here uh, let me introduce you to some nomenclature okay chlorine when it is an element the name that we give it is chlorine okay we have fluorine bromine but you may hear the term chloride and I'll explain to you what happens. So here's electron configuration for chlorine. Okay. Whoa. Now, chlorine, which is right here, is in group 7A, Roman number 7A. There are seven valence electrons, right? And no seven valence electrons in, are in the third energy level, okay? Chlorine is a nonmetal. As I stated before, nonmetals gain electrons. So it's got room for one electron here. Okay. And when chlorine picks up one electron, we have we change its name now to chloride because now it's 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. 3s2, 3p6, okay? Note the difference between the two. Furthermore, it's symbol, because it has a negative charge, we put a superscript negative, okay? And it, and it has the capability of picking up one electron because it has room for one in the p orbit. And so this now, the outermost shell, the valence shell, has eight electrons at magical eight. So the driving force for the chlorine was to pick up one electron and fill up that 1s, 3s2, 3p5 orbit. And when it does that, now it's 3s2, 3p6, and it ends up with a negative charge. When that occurs for nonmetals, their name changes. So the I-N-E gets replaced with I-D-E. And that's why when you have, for example, this, which you put on your French fries, that is called sodium chloride, not sodium chlorine, okay? This is chlorine. This is the element, chlorine. The chloride tells you name-wise that you're dealing with what we call now as an ion, okay? ion. The chlorine, you don't want to ingest. You don't want to put the chlorine in on your French fry. It's a poison. But the chloride, okay, unless you got blood pressure, that not too much of a problem. Okay. And that naming happens for all of the nonmetals. So nitrogen becomes nitride. Oxygen becomes oxide. And we'll get more on that, you know, with time. So and that's why you know by the name sodium chloride that you're dealing with with the ion chloride, not chlorine. All right, let's clear this up. All right, so the table on top is, you know, if you look at it, it kind of describes here because it gives you the electron configuration of the element. So we got hydrogen sitting up here, 1s1, right? Okay, and we got helium up here, has two electrons and 2s2 and so forth down the road. Now, I stated that for the D electrons to just go sequentially from D1 to D10, okay? And this is for chem 130. You'll see here that that's not always the case. There's a multiple reasons behind it, having to do with stability, the interacting with the other three, or, uh, three orbital electrons. But for us, 
sequentially D1 through D10. Note the F, you know, starting with F1 through F14, again, sequentially, okay? Note, noted that that's not always the case. Here we got, we go from one to three to four to five, and a variety of reasons why that's happening, but beyond the scope of, of K130, and we just keep it sequentially. So you can see here how what, what using the, the periodic table can at a glance and very quickly get you to the electron configuration, okay? Note the valence electrons for all the noble gases, okay? First of all, their P orbits are all full and the S orbits are all full, that magical eight. Notice everybody here in group seven has five, P5 orbit, right? They have room for one. That's why they end up with a negative one. So you can see a trend here. Let me, let me, let me show you this. Okay, right now, if you look down here, everybody, the group seven, they're gonna pick up one electron because they got room in that P orbit to pick up, handle one electron. So everybody there, we end up with a negative one charge when they become an ion. Now, jump over to the group, the, the group beforehand. Here, there's room for two electrons, okay? Because it's a P4. Remember, the P can handle a total six. So it's gonna pick up the nonmetals, you're gonna pick up two electrons, become ionic, and end up with a negative two charge. And down here, it will pick up three electrons, okay? The nonmetals. And we end up with a total negative three charge. And the guys here in group four, well, it depends. They can either pick up four or they can lose four. They're, they're on the fence, as I mentioned. And, and depending on the conditions, they can go one way or the other. So but we're gonna focus on, on the ones with the negative three, negative two, negative one, okay? And those are the charts. And these are the guys, the nonmetals that we change the name once they become a negative charge ion that we change the name. So we have the chloride or the chlorine going to chloride, the oxygen going to oxide, the nitrogen going to nitride, and the phosphorus going to phosphide. Okay. Note the metals over here. Okay, these are metals, and they're going to lose. They're going to lose these electrons. Okay, so the, these metals will always, one hundred percent of the time, would have a plus one charge, and these metals will have a plus two charge, one hundred percent of the time. Okay, you will always know their charge. So, what does that mean for the other metals? Well, what kind of charge would they have? And it varies. We're going to get into this. They can vary. For example, iron can be a plus, it can lose two electrons or it can lose three electrons. We can't predict it very efficiently what, what, how many electrons it's going to lose. So, but we're always going to know what this partner is so we can calculate what its charge will be. Okay. But we can, we know for sure group one and group two. And then there's four other guys that we're going to talk about. So you're going to know 100% of the time what their charge is. I call them the sweet 16. There's 16 metals that we know 100% of the time what their charge is, which then tells us that a certain way to name these compounds, okay, depending whether they are 100% of the time or their variable charge. All right, let me clear this up. All right. Well, as we stated, noble gases, including the helium, has, their outermost shell is full. Helium has a, a happy two, whereas all the other noble gases have a, uh, a happy eight, okay? Happy means stable, but your, your book uses the term happy. Okay, so we talked about the valence shell. Those, the valence shell is the outermost uh, layer of the energy levels of these electrons. And that's where all the chemistry occurs. And then, of course, the core electrons are the ones on the inside. Okay. 
So if you look at phosphorus, its electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. Then we go to the third energy level, 3s2, 3p3. Okay, so it has the capability of picking up three electrons, and it does. Why? Because that uh, 3p right here has room for three more. Plus, it is a non-metal. So this guy is going to gain electrons. And guess what? When it gains them, it's going to put them in that 3p3 orbital. And so now it's going to have a total of a three, a negative three charge. And guess what? It, the name goes from phosphorus to phosphide. Ooh, can I spell it? <laughs> Let Phosphide, when it picks up those three electrons, notice, note here how, why it does that. Because again, it's a non-metal. It's going to gain electrons, plus it has room for three electrons. And it's going to fill that 3p orbital, okay? And once it picks up three, guess what? The valence shell, you know, has, right now, went from five, right, in the valence to eight when it picks up three electrons. So, um, the, the question here says, all right, how many valence electrons does it have? Okay, now you can write the electron configuration, okay, and that's fine. It helps you get you, get, get you um, used to writing the electron configuration. You can see that here's the valence shell, outermost shell. Has seven, two in the S, five in the P. Beryllium has two valence electrons, the outermost shell, and aluminum has three valence electrons. Okay, and you can do that, or you can look at the their position on the periodic table. And we have here's aluminum, it's in group 3A, so there's three valence electrons. Okay, uh, beryllium, here it is in group two, has two valence electrons. I just call them VE, valence electrons. I don't know what else we did with it, chlorine, but that this, using these Roman numerals, only for the A elements can tell you how many valence electrons they have, okay? 100% of the time. The other ones have a little bit of amb ambiguity, so we can't predict as, as much. Okay, now, so again, just what I stated here using the, the 1A, the A elements using the Roman numeral, okay? Um, I, let me introduce, sometimes, I guess the Roman numeral numbering is not utilized, but Roman numerals generally for us, we use the letters, okay? This is I, so one is I. The V represents five, okay? And if the I is in front of the V, Roman numeral rules state that we subtract one from five. So here's this represent, IV represents four. Okay, here's five. And then if we put the I after the V, that represents we add. So we end up with six. We add another I, that's seven. And three I's is uh, eight. Uh, we won't have 10, but 10 is X, okay? All right, which is kind of interesting because uh, if you think about it in the Roman numerals, which this is the way they used to do their math, there's no zero, no concept of zero at this point. So I'm kind of I'm perplexed as to how they did without a zero, who knows? Anyway, side note. <laughs> All right, so that A, the A elements, the Roman numeral A represents how many valence electrons so you can at, can at a glance just find its position in your periodic table and determine quite readily how many valence electrons there are, but only for the A elements. So doing that, we look for strontium. We'll find strontium to be in group 2A and it has two valence electrons. Bromines, 
which is in group seven, A, has uh, seven valence electrons. Okay, let me write that down. So we got the 2A, seven, we got the five, the VIII, A, then the VIII, A, and then the IV, A, and then the V, oh, excuse me, <laughs> six, VIA, okay? And that's their position, their position in the periodic table, where we quickly determine how many valence electrons they have. Okay, now the question is, why do atoms want to make compounds? Why do they want to make bonds? Okay, and, and what it is, what I kind of introduced to you is the fact that the drive is that stability. And that stability of these electrons is to obtain eight valence electrons, okay? And that makes them, quote, stable. Makes them happy, I don't know if they're happy or not, but they're stable, okay? So elements will either gain or lose electrons because by doing so, they go into a more stable state, okay? Or they'll put themselves in the position where, let, let, me, let me clarify this and make sure another confusion. If there are certain type of compounds, specifically ionic compounds, they will totally lose electrons or they will totally gain electrons to reach that magical eight, that stable state, okay? On the other end, there's another set of compounds, a little type called covalence, like I mentioned, that they're not gonna totally lose electrons, but they will end up sharing the electrons with another element. And so that can they can obtain that eight octet rule, okay? So in either case, either totally losing them, totally gaining them, or sharing electrons, the drive is to find that stable state, which is that magical eight. So for the first type of compounds, which are called ionic compounds. Why? Because they produce ions. And every time they lose electrons, they're going to become ion. So if you look at sodium, here's the electron configuration. And highlighted is the valence electron. It is a metal, it is in group 1A, so it will lose that electron. And doing so, its outermost shell now is full with eight electrons, right? Think about this thing. Check this, check this out here, okay? Okay, so right now it's outermost shell is in the third energy level and there's one electron sitting out there, okay? Well, from an energy perspective, think about this. It's innate, mother nature being nature, it's not <laughs> being mother nature, it's not gonna energetically favorable to be favorable to gain seven electrons. It's easier just to get rid of one, okay? And in doing so, its new valence shell is the next energy level down, the second energy level. And guess what? It has eight valence electrons. It's full. Okay. Here's that eight, that magical eight valence electrons, eight VE. And in doing so, in losing the electron, now it becomes ionic because it now has a plus one charge. Why? Because there's 11 positives and now there's 10 negatives. Before, there was 11 positives and 11 negatives to give us a net zero, okay? But now it has a plus charge, a plus one. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what happened. We, we call an ion. It became an ion. It has a full-fledged positive charge, okay? Full-fledged positive charge which is now a lot more stable. Now, on the other end, question, a, a cation, yes, Eduardo, we will, they have specific names and I'll give you that in a second. They, uh, because right now we're just gonna call them ions, either positive charge or negative charge, but they have very specific names and we'll, we'll name that here in a second. All right, now at the other end of the spectrum, we have a nominal. Keep in mind, sodium is a metal. Metals, like I stated, lose electrons. Here we have sulfur. Okay. Now the other the other aspect about naming is this: 
sodium, to distinguish the two, okay, between the sodium atom and the sodium ion, that's what we name it. We say it's either the sodium atom, okay, or it is the sodium ion. The name sodium remains the same. We didn't do anything to name the metal. The metal's name becomes whatever it is, stays there, okay? But to distinguish them, we'll add the term atom, meaning it's the element, or ion, meaning it lost it, and it, an electron. On the other end of the spectrum, we have a nonmetal, and its electron configuration is given as follows 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p4. It is a nonmetal. Okay? It will gain two electrons. Why? Because look at the p orbit. It has room for two electrons. The valence shell, the valence electrons is six. Sulfur has six valence electrons. And again, from energy energy perspective, is it easier to get rid of six or add two? From energy perspective, it's easier to add two. Plus, it is a non-metal. Okay, being a non-metal, it will gain two electrons. And in doing so, those two electrons are fill in the the p orbit because there's room for two. So now. It's electron configuration. Let me move my stuff here for a second. Is as follows. And its new valence shell is now has eight electrons. Okay. It does have a negative two charge. Okay. And it is the ion. The other thing that happens is this the name changes where we start off with self, excuse me. <laughs> writing the wrong thing. When it starts off as the element, it is called sulfur. When it becomes the ion, and now the name changes to sulfide. Okay, so for nomenclature purposes, the nonmetal, their names get changed from the element elemental name to an I I D E. Okay. The other aspect about the IDE is it is a the single element. And, and this is important here. You remember, because in nomenclature, we're going to learn about these guys. SO4 negative 2. Okay, guess what? This guy is called sulfate. Notice the, 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 the uh, suffix eight. You got SO3 negative 2. It's called sulfite. Okay. When you see the 8, ATE, and the ITE, and you see the SUL, sulfur, well, that tells you that it's sulfur with oxygen involved in the structure. When you see ID, it's just simply the sulfur itself. Okay? And that's one way to help you distinguish between sulfide, sulfate, sulfite. All right, but back to this here. So now the ion is, uh, ion is generated, it has achieved the octet, and now its stability is, is there. Now, food for thought here, because this is related to uh, the chapter where we deal with the uh, uh, periodic table. Now, what does your intuition tell you here? Okay, let's compare the sodium atom versus the sodium ion. The model is that we have a round shape, a sphere, nucleus, electrons around it, okay? Which means that there's a radius, there's a diameter there, right? Now, what would you predict based on what you learned to date? If I needed to know the diameter or the radius, diameter, slash radius, uh, radius of the sodium atom or the sodium ion, which one do you think would be bigger? The sodium atom or the sodium ion? 
the ion will be bigger. Okay, and let's think this through now. The atom, okay, now let's think this through. The atom will be correct. Notice something, the atom has three energy levels, right? Three layers, one, two, and three. Once we lose that one electron on the third energy level, that's gone, it's empty. So the next valence shell is the second energy level, okay, right here. So that means that the sodium ion shrinks in diameter, okay, relative to a lost one, exactly where, okay, because it lost an electron, so it got smaller. So with respect to the diameter, the ion is smaller than the atom. All right, now let's think about the anion, or excuse me, the, the negative charge one. Might as well turn it in, give you the name. When it becomes a positive charge, we call that a cation. When it is a negative charge, we call that an anion. So the cation is much smaller in diameter than the atom itself or sodium. What about sulfur? What, are you, what is your prediction there? Okay. Would you think the anion would be bigger or smaller than the sulfur atom? What do you guys think? Bigger, and that would be correct, right? Because look at look what happened to the sulfur atom. Two electrons came in to the outermost three energy level p orbit, right? Also keep in mind those those. Um, electrons are negative charge. So where before I had six negative charge on the third energy level, now there's eight more negativity, more negative charge, more repulsion. And so what happens is they repel by each other. By repelling each other, it gets bigger. So the sulfur sulfide sulfide is bigger in diameter than sulfur. Okay. All right, good. Now, <laughs> here, they're asking you to write the electron configuration, but be careful when you do this, okay? Look at what you're given here. Look at the fact that they put charges. You got potassium plus one, sodium negative, excuse me, uh, N negative three, which is the nitride, by the way, and magnesium plus two, okay? Now, you might be tempted to write down the electron configuration for the atom, and some people do that. You put it for the atom and then realize, okay, now I can remove, if it's a positive, I can remove a, um, a, uh, a, an electron. But here's the electron configuration, right? So if I was doing potassium, okay, if I was doing potassium by itself, and compare the two, it would be, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s1, okay? That is for potassium, the atom. But here, you're being asked to write the electron configuration for the ion, which means that valence shell is gone. Now, don't confuse the two. These are two different, two different, uh, electron configuration. The one on top I wrote is for the atom and the one for the, and the, the bottom one given is for the ion, okay, specifically the cation, which by the way, is the electron configuration for the noble gas before it, okay? You know, the driving forces get that magical way to, to get an electron configuration like a noble gas. Okay, so for metals, by losing the electrons, now they become, they have the same number of electrons as the noble gas behind it. We call that isoelectronic. The potassium ion, the potassium ion is isoelectronic with argon, okay? because they share the same number of electrons. I did not say <laughs> that 
and potassium ion became argon, right? How can potassium, think about this, how can potassium become argon? Why don't you take a shot at it? How can I make potassium into argon? I got to lose a proton, exactly. And we're not losing protons here. Way back when we talked about, I can lose electrons, I can lose neutrons all day long. I would not change what that element is, okay? And so this is, this is important. Don't say that potassium ion now is, is argon, that's incorrect. What is correct is to say the potassium ion is isoelectronic with argon because they had the same number of electrons. That's what the iso prefix is meaning the same. All right, so then uh, we have the nitrogen, which was a, a, a 2p3, right? Because nitrogen is in group, group five, so the five valence electrons has room for three electrons. So it picked up three, and now its name, FYI, this is called the nitride. It's not the nitrogen. Nitrogen is, is original N, but when it becomes ionic, specifically an anion, because it picked up uh, three electrons, it is now um, isoelectronic with neon. And then magnesium is also isoelectronic with neon. Yeah, think about this for a second. Let's clear this out. Nitrogen, by picking up three electrons, now shares the same number of electrons as a noble gas in front of it, which is neon. Okay. And magnesium, by losing, being a metal, losing two electrons, now also becomes isoelectronic with neon. They share the number of valence electrons and they have the octet full. Okay. In both cases. All right, so um, group 1A, ionic charge, I mentioned this, would have a plus one charge. Group 2A will have a plus two charge. Again, group 1A and 2A are metals, and so they will lose electrons, okay? The group 3A metals, the group 3A metals, of which say aluminum, will have a plus three charge. We're not going to work a lot with the metalloids. You know, they can they can lose and gain electrons. They're kind of totally different chemistry. We're going to be dealing with metals and elements. Now the group seven, by uh, picking up one electron, will have a negative one charge. Okay, and the group six will pick up two electrons. These are all non-metals, remember? So non-metals, they're beyond group 4A. So above group 4A, they start gaining electrons. Okay, because it's much easier from an energy perspective to gain electrons. All right, um, negative two charge for the, the group seven, six, excuse me. Okay, and the key thing to remember, non-metals want to gain electrons, they become negative charged and they are called anions. And here are the charges again. It may sound like overemphasis, but it's important, <laughs> obviously. Okay, metals lose electrons, they become cations. And non-metals gain electrons, they become anions. Okay. Now, the charge that they end up with, it depends on um, how many electrons are in the valence shell. They, the metals could lose one up to three, become one to a plus three. And the non-metals can be uh, negative three to a negative one, okay? Charge. Group four where carbon sits, like I stated, these guys are on the fence and they can lose all four uh, electrons or they can gain. So their charge could vary from a plus four to a negative four depending on what was happening to them. And of course the eights, they're not gonna do anything. They're always gonna have a zero charge, they're normal gases. So that, that 
sequence there, you go, if you go across the periodic table with respect to the A elements, okay? Not the B elements, the ones in this in, inside, uh, because those are variable charges, not, not the A. All right, so what charge uh, would they become? So here, you know, the way, best quickest way to do it is to find it in the product table, you know, determine whether it's a metal or non-metal, determine if it's metal, non-metal, then determine what group it's in, and that will tell you how many valence electrons, which then will tell you if it can be a plus charge or negative charge. So let's enter group one, it will be a plus one charge, okay? Magnesium is, is in group 2A, it's a metal, it will lose electrons, it will have a plus two charge in the ion form. Sulfur will pick up two electrons, okay? It's in group six. Okay. 6A, meaning it'll pick up two electrons. Why? Because it is a non-metal. Bromine is a non-metal. It will gain electrons. Question is how many? Find it on the periodic table, it's in group seven. It will pick up one, okay? They're trying to make, get to that eight. Sulfur, which is in group six, is gonna pick up two, okay? Bromine group seven only needs one. Nitrogen is in group five, okay? Nitrogen is in group five. It's gonna pick up three to get that magical eight. But aluminum is in non-metal. Excuse me, what did I, I <laughs> aluminum is a metal. Okay, what I meant to, say, meant to say was sulfur, bromine, and nitrogen. Aluminum is in group three, will have a plus three charge. Now, let me add something here. With respect to naming, okay, we mentioned sulfur already. When it becomes an ion, it, its name changes to sulfide. Bromine becomes bromide, name-wise. Here's the nomenclature part. Nitrogen becomes nitride, okay? Uh, we did sulfur to sulfide. And uh, uh, it, all the, the fluorine becomes fluoride, chlorine, chloride, iodide, iodine, iodide, okay? All right. Now, we're gonna be doing is we're gonna start putting together cation and the anions. So you hopefully can start seeing here how we can start combining. We can combine the cation magnesium with the, any of the anions. Magnesium with either any of these, okay? Because to put ionic compounds together, ionic compounds, It's a combination of a cation plus an anion, but more importantly, it's a combination of a metal plus a non-metal. And that's what distinguishes an ionic compound from a covalent compound that we're gonna talk about later on, okay? And now, when we put the positive and the negative, we got to put them together such that we put enough of each together so the charges disappear to zero. The net charge is zero. So if I put a positive one ion, I only need one negative ion to come together. And when I do that, guess what? I'm writing, I'm making, I'm putting compounds together. And I'm starting to put compounds together. But to do that, we have to understand the charge that they have before we start putting them together. Okay, and then you're going to see we're going to put put them in and start writing the, the the subscript because sometimes if it's a it's straightforward plus and negative, they come one to one. But you can have two pluses and one negative one negative charge, or like a negative two ion. Okay, that means I need to have two plus one charges and one negative two charge. And that, that tells us the subscript of how many of each we need. And once we start putting them together, we also go from there. Next step is to name, name them. Okay. Let me give you a quick example. 
Let's say I want to put the sulfite and the lithium together, okay? Well, I can see that lithium has a plus one charge and the sulfite has a negative two charge, right? So that means I need two lithiums, which is a plus charge, to cancel out the negative two of the sulfite. So that two I wrote here becomes a subscript. So the formula becomes Li subscript S, okay? That is the formula for this compound. The subscript is, it tells me how many lithium pluses I need to get together. This is an ionic compound because I got a metal and a non-metal. Furthermore, lithium sulfide, excuse my writing, the, my mouse it's resolution so so, lithium sulfide, that is the name of that compound I just put together. So if I'm given the name, I need to figure out how to write the formula. If I'm given the formula, I need to figure out how to write the name. That, ladies and gentlemen, is nomenclature, okay? All right. And even with this example, I'll give you, by, by the time we're done, you'll be able to put together you have access to about, I don't know, four or 500 compounds that you have access that you can mix and match, okay? Isoelectronic, I already mentioned what that meant. That means the same number of electrons of as some other species. So, uh, <coughs> excuse me, magnesium plus two ion is isoelectronic with neon and the phosphide, oh, there you go. This was phosphorus, now it becomes phosphide is isoelectronic with argon. Okay, a couple more slides, and then we'll probably finish it up, finish this chapter, and we'll take a break and then uh, we'll continue. All right, so the electron configuration for the specific ion is as follows, okay? We have the calcium ion, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. Now, if this were calcium, okay, calcium would be, you know, four, oh, I'm wrong. If it was calcium, uh, let's do calcium here. Calcium would be uh, argon, shorthand, 4s2. Okay. All right, but we're talking about the ion. So it's 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. Okay. All right, the calcium ion is isoelectronic with argon. The oxide that is the O negative two is isoelectronic with neon. The chloride, notice the naming, the chloride is isoelectronic with argon. And the aluminum ion is isoelectronic with neon. Hopefully you can see here that by losing or gaining electrons, the driving force is to be isoelectronic with a noble gas because they, by doing that, uh, the valence shell now has the obtained that magical eight, if you will, that stable eight. All right. Um, all right, here's one. We're using uh, selenium, and then selenium is a group two uh, element, so it will pick up um, <coughs> two electrons, excuse me, two electrons. And then we're dealing with aluminum 27 and aluminum 27 uh, ion. So obviously for selenium, there's no change exchange of protons. We, we got read and ion. We still got 34 protons for SE, okay? Where they differ and the same number of neutrons because we're dealing with selenium 78, okay? Where they differ is the number of electrons, 34 versus 36. The same is true for aluminum 27, okay? They both have 
13 protons and they both had the same number of neutrons because we're dealing with aluminum 27, okay? Where they differ is the number of electrons. All right. Okay. Um, that, ladies and gentlemen, brings us to the end of chapter five. All right. Moving along here. Okay. Tell you what, let's take a quick, uh, let's come back at uh, 2.45, take a break, and then we'll continue with um, uh, chapter six, which is another short uh, chapter, but nevertheless, we'll get you ready for next Friday, for next Tuesday, I should say. The reason I said Friday, because normally, normally during the, the full week semester, the exams are on Friday. All right, let's take a quick break. We'll be back. Okay, I'm back. Oh, I forgot to mention my, my wallpaper here. It gives you an idea of the chemicals and maybe some of the flavors you like of food. It's a lot of these are classified as asterisk things that they smell pretty good. And they're made up of a combination of what's called a, an or organic and organic acid. It was called specifically a carboxylic acid and an alcohol. You combine those to make esters and you get all kinds of nice little flavors and odors. Anyway, any questions about uh, the chapter we just got done with? Chapter five. Uh, if not, I will jump into chapter six. In fact, they'll, they'll get us ahead, which is a good thing. Get us ahead. Chapter six deals specifically with the periodic table and some trends of which I just uh, previously just mentioned. We started one with especially uh, diameters and so forth, but we'll continue with that here in a second. So, any questions before I continue? Okay. All right, well, let's uh, talk about the periodic table. So you can see it's only 25 slides. Yeah. So this interesting looking character here, Dimitri Mendeleev, 1869. He is the uh, founder of the periodic table. And what he did for that time period, he took the chemicals of what they knew and uh, the elements that they knew about and put them in the table in which uh, uh, kind of classified them that the ones that had similar chemical properties, okay? Obviously he didn't know at the time like we do now that as I mentioned, when you're in the same column uh, they exhibit, uh, they share, all the elements share the number of uh, valence electrons, and that results in similar chemical properties. So anyway, uh, Dimitri had this first periodic table, and uh, there were some blanks in there where he predicted should be some other elements, and sure enough, other scientists uh, went for a search and found them in the prediction, so he did his pretty good work. Keep it in mind that um, this work, you know, this is before the time of all this fancy scientific equipment we have now, and it's just the power of observation and, and, and setting up reactions and experimentation, the powers of observation. Anyway, so Dmitry Mendeleev, Russian scientist, responsible for the uh, first periodic table. Uh, mostly, another scientist, what he did was uh, put the elements that, that were known at the time and rearranged them. He put them in the order of increasing atomic number. And this is the table that we're now familiar with. Okay. And along that, he came up with the idea of what came up, the idea of what's called the periodic law. The elements in the same column exhibit similar properties. 
we now know based on the how electrons are all put together, as I stated before, is that it turns out that the valence electrons, remember valence electrons, that's where all the chemistry is occurring, that the elements in the same column share the same number of valence electrons and therefore resulting in similar reactivity. Okay. Now there's a, here's an example of the long period, periodic table. I had mentioned before the F elements, remember the F elements down at the bottom, they had their own name, but if we were to put them back in, in where they should be, you end up with this periodic table. This is the long periodic table, kind of, kind of mess, kind of distorts a little bit. So what they did, they took the F elements, the ones in green, pulled them out, got the periodic table, squished it in, and, and that's the result of the periodic table that we're all familiar with. The numbering sequence uh, on top, that's what is being uh, used now. They're trying to change, get rid of the Roman numerals and utilize the numbers one through 18. Uh, pros and cons with that, in anything new, there's pros and cons. Uh, I tend to like the Roman numerals because that depicts the number of valence electrons. Uh, there's no relationship here with valence electrons. I imagine you could figure it out, but the, the, there are some advantages to the Roman numerals. Anyway, this is the long periodic table. There have been a variety of different types of peri periodic tables. There's a circular periodic table given here, or the spiral periodic table. We'll kind of, you know, put them together. Here's another one here. There's an alternative one. Um, this one here is quite interesting because again, it does predict predict uh, other uh, elements, specifically in this region here, where it is predicted to have what you call the super actinides. Well, don't know yet. Maybe, maybe it'll be there. Who knows? Right. So, anyway, back to the uh, periodic table as we know it. We talked about uh, Niels Bohr and his introduction of uh, the energy levels, which uh, really altered the shape of the periodic table a little bit. So we talked about the S block, P block, et cetera, given here and the electrons and, and gives us an idea of how all of these electrons are put together, which then gives us insight into the reactivity of, of these elements, okay? Now, the horizontal role of the periodic table, periodic table, as we know it, the one we, you have printed out, we call that the period. I've been using that also slash energy level. Okay, because they are in effect uh, seven energy levels and we got seven periods. Now the vertical column, they're called the group. Okay, sometimes you may see a term used family. There's another term for it, being, uh, the most common name is the group. And so elements in the same group exhibit similar properties, similar reactivity, okay? And uh, there are two uh, groups of elements. We all familiar, you're familiar with the A group. Those are Roman numeral one to AA. Okay. And then we got the B group. Now, apparently the B group, those are the D elements, ones inside. They have their own little name. Those are called transition metals. Okay. So we have the main group metals, which are all the A group. And then the B groups are the transition metals. That's the general name for them, okay? So we got period two, period three, basically representing, as I stated, uh, different energy levels. And then the groups, the vertical columns called group. And like I stated, you also have, you may see the term family. They belong to the same family. Now, some of these families slash groups have their own more specific name, okay? For example, group of 1A, they have their own little special name. They are called the alkaline metals, except hydrogen. Obviously, hydrogen is not a metal. Uh, it tends to be confused that it's a metal because it happens to be in that position in the periodic table. So bear in mind, it's there because hydrogen um, will have one valence electron. 
and can lose that one valence electron, which we're going to learn about down the road when we talk about acids. And that's why hydrogen is placed in that column. Okay. Now, group 2A, they have their own special name. They're called the alkaline, okay, alkaline earth metals. And then the group seven, where fluorine is, fluorine, fluorine, bromine, these are called the halogens. Halogens, you may be familiar if you have a car with halogen lamps, okay, very bright lights. All right. And then obviously you're familiar with the last column, group AA, those are the noble gases named that way because they are very unreactive, okay, because they have the octet fulfilled. Now the transition metals are the ones here listed in, in the B group, okay, the ones listed in gray and yellow, okay. Uh, <clears throat> they're not very predictable with respect to their properties compared to the ones in the group A, okay? Because uh, they're just unpredictable. And so they have their own little, their own little um, properties about them. And we'll talk about some of them, not all of them, but some of them. Now we have the uh, inner transition metals, okay? Below them, the inner transition metal are the, the, the green, okay? So we got transition metals, and then we got the inner transition metals, which are depicted in green. Now the ones that are in gray, and I guess mustard color here, based on my screen, also are transition metals, but they have their own specific name. The first row is called the lanthanide series. Okay, the lanthanide series, and then the one below them are called the uh, actinide series. Now, also, the lanthanide series have also been named the rare earth metals, and they go from CE to LU. Now, all the actinide series, all of them are radioactive. Now, you can see their periodic table, uh, their atomic weight is in, in parentheses because they break down uh, and decompose so quickly. Uh, you should note that uh, from greater than and equal to 93, elements are all man-made. So they put them in what are called particle accelerators where you got matter banging up against each other and creating new, new elements. Okay. Uh, so a couple of questions you might be asked, for example, you might say, you might ask you a question like, uh, name the alkaline metal in the third period. So we find the third period we find all the alkaline metals and that turns out to be sodium. So sodium is in the third period and it's in the first row, first column, which is the alkaline metals, except hydrogen. The halogens are the ones in the group seven, okay? Way in the far right of the periodic table. And then all we go to, go to the second period and that happens to be fluorine. So fluorine is a halogen in the second period. And then the noble gases, far right column, we go through the fourth, fourth period, and that is Kr, aka krypton. Okay. Not to be confused with kryptonite, <laughs> which is an alloy of some sort of the metal. Okay. So please don't write kryptonite. <laughs> it's, it's krypton, krypton. All right, so we talked before about who are the metals, who are the nonmetals, and who are the metalloids. Uh, here, are the ones in kind of, I guess, reddish color, light red color, are the nonmetals. Then the metalloids are the ones listed in green. And then the blue are all the metalloids. Okay. Now, when we talk about these elements, we talk about, we can uh, mention some of the properties, and that is talk about the radius. I kind of introduced that to you a little bit. And that's basically the radius is the distance from the nucleus to the outermost shell, the outermost electron, the valence, valence shell. And the general trend, you can, you, you know, you can, you can see that as you go down the periodic table, obviously you increase the energy level and you're increasing the size of the element as you go down the periodic table. So, the trend is this, that as 
down the periodic table, radius goes, gets bigger, simply because there's more energy levels resulting in a bigger radius, okay? Now, when we go from uh, uh, right to left of the periodic table, the radius increases, or if the other way around is this. As you go from left to right, the radius is smaller, okay? Tomatoes, tomatoes, whichever way you want to look at it. Point being is, is, is this, why is that happening? Well, here's, here's an explanation. A lot of times you're asked that question, okay? And you're also asked not to re simply repeat the trend because we know that going down the periodic table, the radius uh, that gets bigger simply because we're adding more energy levels to the atom. So sodium is bigger than potassium, okay? And sodium, uh, uh, excuse me, <laughs> I'm half asleep here. Sodium is bigger than lithium. That's what I was looking. I was looking at lithium and I said potassium, okay? All right, and the same is true for argon, which is bigger than neon. Okay, so down the table, it gets bigger. As we go from left to right, in that direction, the radius gets smaller. So that means that, let's say nitrogen, nitrogen is smaller than carbon, right? Sulfur is smaller than phosphorus. And when we compare calcium, let's say potassium and calcium, calcium is smaller. And in this group, bromine is smaller between potassium and calcium. Now, what is happening here? Why is that the case? It stands to reason, it makes logical sense that we go down the periodic table, we just simply get more energy levels, right? But as we go across the periodic table, we're not increasing any energy levels. The one thing that we are increasing is the number of protons and electrons, okay? So give this some thought, let me clear this up. If we look at, let's say, calcium, and we compare it with bromine, okay, you can see that, you know, calcium has 20 protons, 20 positives and 20 electrons, right? Whereas bromine has 35 protons and 35 electrons. So think of it as like magnets. If I, calcium has 20 magnets, right? An X amount of force is being applied to the magnets to attract each other. The positive and the negatives are attracting to each other because simply because of the difference in charge, okay? They don't collapse into each other for a variety of reasons. And neutrons are there for one to prevent that from happening, okay? But as we go across the periodic table, we pick up on the number of protons and the number of electrons. So we increase that positive negative charge. The result is we're getting more force occurring between the protons and the electrons within the group. The result is that those electrons of bromine are pulled in tighter than those electrons from calcium, okay? Hopefully that makes sense to you. So across the periodic table, we are increasing the number of proton and electrical charge. And so the electrons, the, the positive charge increases. And so the electrons are being pulled a lot closer. So the atom actually gets smaller as we go across the periodic table. So this kind of snowman kind of helps you out with the trend. You can see as you look at the upright snowman, got the small head, the round bottom, if you will, gets bigger. 
as you go down the product table. Take this same snowman, flip him on the side, that represents going across the same period. The radius gets smaller because we increase the positive charge, the proton charge. All right. And that's what I mean, the reasoning. So I, I understand you can say you go across the product table, it gets smaller, and that's just reporting the trend. But take it one step further to ask the question to explain why it is getting smaller. Okay. Here's a, 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 float, a, a diagram that kind of shows you the, the, the radius, kind of relative size, small numbers. Now, of course, there's always exceptions to the rule. I'm telling you right now, in science, there is nothing 100%. If somebody tells you there is, they're lying to you. There's nothing 100%. There's always exceptions to the rule, but the general trend is there. That as you go across the product table, you can see the radius gets smaller. And as you go down the periodic table, uh, you can see the element gets a, a little bigger. All right? Okay. So you may be asked questions about, okay, we've got three elements here, O, uh, uh, terillium, selenium, and oxygen, okay? Uh, which is larger may be the question. Well, to answer that, you first got to find them on the periodic table. And when you do that, you can see that they are in the same group, specifically group 6A, okay? So now that you find them in the same product table, in the same group, I should say, that means that as you go down the product table, obviously the bottom one will be bigger simply because it's more energy levels, hence having a larger radius. Now you have the question between magnesium, silicon, and sulfur. Again, refer to the periodic table, find them on the periodic table relative to each other so you can be able to answer the question. And they happen to be in the same group, specific group, period, excuse me, in that group, period three. So going across the periodic table, you got a magnesium, the far left, silicon, and then sulfur. Keep in mind what I just stated, as you go across the periodic table, you're picking up more protons, more electrons, that proton charge is greater resulting in the radius being pulled in. Therefore, um, in this case, sulfur would be smaller, okay? And magnesium here would be larger within the same period. All right, so there are videos. Uh, read uh, Dr. Kim's or listen to memory. Listen to Dr. Kim concerning atomic size and give you an alternative perspective. And, uh, Let's talk about something else. Any questions before we proceed? We're gonna be done with this chapter here in a few, so a few more. All right, so <clears throat> we're gonna talk about two uh, physical properties. The first one is called ionization energy, okay? Ionization energy. Let's, let's, break, down, let's break down the word. Okay, did you break down ionization? Actually, we, we understand energy means some amount of energy or force necessary to do something. But let's look at the word ionization. Okay. Ionization, you've got the term ion, the prefix ion, and ization. So we're making something into an ion. And that's what's happening. What we are doing is we're taking an element. An element has a zero net charge. It is equal positive, equal negative, equal protons, equal number of electrons, okay? It has an X number of electrons and has a net zero. We're putting energy into the system and by some means, and where we, what we are attempting to do is to remove an electron. Here's the process that's occurring, okay? We got starting material on the left of the arrow, which is the sodium element. We put an energy into the system, all right, to create an ion, ionization, all right, to create an electron, to remove an electron. Okay. So ionization energy is the amount of energy necessary to remove an electron from a neutral atom. 
not to be confused with the next property that we're going to call. Uh, um, we're going to call it something different. Okay, we'll, we'll get there in a second. Electronegativity. Okay, but this is ionization energy, amount of energy necessary to remove an electron. Now, this before we go on here, let's, let's think about this for a second. All right, we just talked about how we go as as um, let's look at the periodic table. Okay, and we can deduce some some stuff on our own. All right. Now, if we look at let's go within within a group. Okay, so let's just talk about this group in here. You know, what do they share? Well, what they share is one valence electron, right? All right. So we also know that based on the trend we just re we just talked about, that we got one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven energy levels. So if we compare, let's say, the electron on FR versus the electron on Li lithium, would you agree that that one sole electron on lithium is a lot closer than that one electron for FR? So we got the nucleus here for lithium, let's say lithium. And that one valence electron for lithium is, you know, the second energy level, it's sitting right there, okay? We look at FR, we got one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. It's in the seventh energy level, that one sole electron sitting out there all, out there all by itself. Well, wouldn't you agree here that, that the electron from FR is a lot further away than the electron for lithium, right? Makes sense based on their position on the product table. Okay, with that information, now think about it. Who do you think is interacting much less? In other words, if we were to measure the interaction of that one little electron with the nucleus, who would have possibly the less interaction, lithium or FR? What do you think? Based on the position of that little electron that's sitting there all by itself. Okay, and both of them, they got one electron, but who's interacting with it much, much less? Exactly. So therefore, FR's electrons are a lot further away. It's still there, but further away. That would suggest that those electrons, that electron would be much easier to remove than the one from lithium, okay? Simply because the one from lithium is closer to the nucleus compared to the one for FR, okay? So I would predict they would take less energy for FR to get rid of that electron, less ionization energy for FR than it would for lithium. Makes logical sense, right? Mm -hmm. All right, now, with that in mind, let's go the other direction. Let's go across the periodic table. What, what, what we have learned from that, we know that as we go across the periodic table, that the radius got smaller, okay? And it got smaller because as we go across the periodic table, there are more protons and more electrons, so that proton force gets stronger. So what would you predict if I were to compare the ionization energy of, let's say, fluorine versus lithium? Okay. Which one would you predict will require more energy to knock off one electron, fluorine or the lithium? based on what we know exactly what the fluorine for two reasons. One, those electrons are being held on tighter because there's more proton. Second, the fluoride is a non-metal. And being a non-metal, the nature of the beast is, I'm not giving up my electrons. I'm keeping my electrons. I want to gain electrons, not give them up. So that in itself is enough to say that when I compare a metal, who wants to give up their electron versus a non-metal, it's going to take more energy 
to get rid of an electron for a nonmetal. Plus the fact in the same period, those electrons for the nonmetal happen to be in the right side are being held on to much tighter. Okay. All right, good. So with that in mind, we can do some predictions and really we just did some predictions, but also we can see how, how uh, the trend would be that metals have low ionization energy because they want to lose electrons basically, okay? They want to be isoelectronic with the normal gas behind it. And now metals will have a higher energy because they, want, they don't want to lose electrons, they want to gain them. Plus the fact that they have more protons within the same period and they hold on to electrons much tighter. All right. And so you can see if we plot the data with some of these elements, you can see you can see the general trend trend. That let me change the color here. If we go starting with hydrogen right here, we go across the helium. Wow, the ionization energy starts at about maybe, I don't know, about, about 13 and a half energy units and kicks up to close to 25 for helium. Okay, helium holds on to their electrons tighter. Then as we wrap around the product table, we're right here with lithium and go all the way across for, uh, uh, to neon. Again, you can see lithium, it's a, it's a metal, it wants to give up electrons. Amount of energy about five, a little bit about five, whereas neon, about 22 units of energy, right? And you can see the trend. Yes, there's a little hopping back and forth, but the general trend is from left to right, it takes more energy because again, as we go across the product table, those electrons are being held on too much tighter. Now we flip around around the product table, we're at the third period here, we go across to argon. The general trend again is going in upward direction. And note the general trend as we go across, as we get bigger and bigger in size going down the product table. So we got one, two, three, four. Here's the fifth, and here's the fifth period. The slope of that line is getting smaller and smaller. Fifth, means like the sixth period, okay? Starts to drop. You know, it stands to reason now you think about it as we go down the product table, all the elements get bigger and bigger, higher energy level, right? So those electrons that are further are further away. And so regardless of the fact that you're picking up more electrons, uh, as you go across more, more protons, you go across the periodic table, the, the sheer fact that overall they're bigger, our, our slope starts to get smaller compared to where we were initially, right? But the general trend is that across the periodic table, more energy required. All right. Okay, so it, which which has a larger IE and why? And so you got three. Okay, we're not talking about the radius, but they're kind of related, right? Make makes sense if you think about it. Remember, we talked about the radius going across the periodic table. As we go across the periodic table, the radius got smaller. That would correspond with the ionization getting smaller because those electrons are being held on tighter. So one, we got chlorine, aluminum, and magnesium. You can you can attack this question one or two ways. One, realize that you're they're all in the same period and understand that chlorine in the far right is smaller, hence it's going to take more energy, it's smaller in radius, take more energy to get rid of the electrons, go that route. Or alternatively, recognize that you are dealing with two metals and one non-metal. Well, that in itself should answer the question very rapidly because non-metals want to gain electrons, not get rid of them. Okay, so they have a tendency to hold on to the electrons tighter than aluminum and magnesium, which are metals, okay? Second one, if we look at the, these three, okay, recognize it, find them on the periodic table, we'll find them that they're all in the same group. They're all in the group 1A. That tells us that RB is much bigger than lithium, okay? 
So that in itself would say, you know, they're all metals, so I can't use the metal non-metal thing to figure it out, but I can find them on the product table and realize that RB is much bigger. So therefore, its electron is further away from the nucleus, so it doesn't hold on to it very tight, as tightly as, say, lithium. So uh, lithium will require more energy to a higher, would have a higher ionization, ionization energy than the other two, simply because that electron is a little bit closer to the nucleus and held on a little bit tighter. Okay. All right. Perfect timing here. So those are some general trends on this. So don't forget to to uh, you know besides this video, but Dr. Kim's video concerning ionization energy. Okay. Because we're gonna, this would uh, um, kind of give us insight as to why certain reactions occur compared to others. Also, we're gonna use a different property called um, electronegativity, which sometimes students confuse with ionization energy. But electronegativity is a very important property in chemistry, okay? Which is this, okay? Electronegativity. Electronegativity is the ability of an atom to attract bonded electrons, okay? Whereas ionization energy, we talked about the elements all by themselves. Here, we're talking about a chemical bond, a bond where um, electrons are, are being shared. Specifically, we're talking about covalent compounds. Now, the thing to remember is very straightforward. Fluorine, which sits about right here, is the most electronegative element, all right? And so that is our benchmark if we ever need to compare the electronegativity of, let's say, carbon versus nitrogen. All we got to do is find its position relative to fluorine. And whoever is closer to fluorine tells us, well, that's the more electronegative uh, 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 atom or element, okay? And what that means is, is the following. If we look at a bond between carbon and nitrogen, this is a, a that line represents a bond of two electrons. We're gonna have a lot more to say about these bonds here in a bit later on, okay? That bond is shared electrons, shared electrons. Those electrons, and being shared, it's gonna be shared either equally or not equally, okay? If the bonds are shared equally, then we have a set of properties associated with that particular bond. If the bond is shared unequally, then we have a different set of properties associated with that bond, which then results in the, depending on where that bond is, on the properties of the overall molecule. So it's related to the type of bond that's being, uh, being uh, created, okay? When the elements are both the same, like carbon-carbon bond, then there's an equal sharing, okay? Because we got two carbons, they're both the same. So those, that bond between them those two electrons are being shared equally. But whenever you got two different elements like carbon and nitrogen, there's an unequal sharing that occurs, okay? And which direction, who's pulling the electrons onto yourself depends on the electronegativity. And how do we determine that? Well, we look at carbon, we look at nitrogen in your position relative to fluorine, and we see that nitrogen is much closer to fluorine Therefore, nitrogen is a lot more elect electronegative, which means that these electrons are being pulled onto nitrogen much stronger than the carbon. And we draw a little arrow like this with a plus N at the end of the arrow, which designates, tells us that this bond is what we call polar. Because, because the nature of the beast, polar meaning, you know, the earth is polar. We got a North Pole and a South Pole. Well, this bond is polar because on one end, because the electrons are being pulled toward nitrogen, it creates 
more electron density onto nitrogen than it does to carbon, which results in carbon having more of a positive character and the nitrogen having more of a negative character, which means we have a polar bond, which then affects the physical, the, the properties of that bond, which can affect the properties of the overall molecule, okay? All right, so a lot of information here at the last minute, but this, this, this is something that's gonna, uh, is gonna come into play over and over again when you talk to bonds and different type of bonds that we create. And because of electronegativity in a bond, allows us as chemists to be able to synthesize compounds because without electronegativity in the bond, it's very difficult to create new compounds. And uh, fortunately, this property occurs so we can tap into it to make compounds. Okay, noble gases, of course, don't have electronegativity because they don't form bonds for one, okay? Your electrons are all, you got it octet. All right, so electronegativity will come back. We're going to use it again when we start talking about chemical bonds, specifically covalent bonds. Okay? Don't confuse ionization energy with electronegativity. Ionization energy deals with a single atom, whereas electronegativity deals with the sharing of a bonded um, um, atoms. And the sharing could be equal sharing or unequal sharing. Think of it as a tug of war. You, know, you get two people, same weight, same strength. You're pulling on that rope equally. There's no, no movement. No one's going one way to the direction. You got a 200 pounder, 200 pounder, same strength. That thing doesn't move. But let's say you stick a 400 pounder and a 200 pounder, it's going to move. So that pull goes in the direction of the 400 pounder. All right. Well, that, ladies and gentlemen, brings us to the end of chapter six. We're moving along. We will continue with chapter seven next week. Okay. And don't forget, next week you also have your next exam. So we ready for that. If you have any questions, feel free to send me an email. Uh, we get them answered as soon as possible. I also will. Uh, use some of the time on Tuesday. If you have any questions for those, the next exam, we can go over them. If not, we'll continue with the next chapter, okay? All right, well, you guys have a good weekend.